sort of a Victorian view right here in 2015. And um, I'm going to ask uh, Mick Keogh, who's Executive Director of Australian Farm Institute, to come forward and join us. And we've asked Mick this morning to just be a bit of a provocateur, take us out to the future a bit, throw a few challenges at us, make us a little uncomfortable possibly, don't know if we'll do that. Um, and we've asked Mick to do that because as the Executive Director of AFI, he's well placed to see nationally across all sectors, has a really good global look as well. Um, previously General Manager of Policy um, at Farmers in NSW and also 10 years before that around General Agricultural Management Consulting. Um, comes from a farming background himself, so he's well versed both from a policy and a practical point of view. If you're a, a visitor from out of space or a new minister coming in fresh to a portfolio like agriculture and you, you sat down and thought, where are the winners going to be? Um, you would look at the horticulture sector and you would say, um, healthy, food, nutritious, all the health diets all say you should eat more fruit and vegetables, so that one's going to be ticked. If you look at its land footprint, it's not huge, and it's a very efficient and high-value converter of water to food, so we'll tick that box. Uh, it doesn't produce a whole pile of greenhouse gases. Uh, doesn't result in uh, degradation to the environment anywhere near like the broadacre sectors do, so we'll tick that box. Um, export market demand, we'll tick that box. Regional development, uh, jobs in the bush, uh, regional uh, industrial oppor in industry opportunities, we'll tick that box. So, so if you're a new minister coming in, like your new minister, you would say horticulture is where it's going to be. Horticulture is where the promise is. And yet, if you're an old minister going out, I suspect you'd say, bloody horticulture. Absolutely hopeless. Um, that's, the sort of, that's the sort of scenario I think you'd look at. Um, you may argue with that, but uh, I think it's interesting to go through some of the numbers and go through some of the history. But of all the agriculture sectors in, in Australia, I would say horticulture's got the most potential. It ticks the most boxes and it's consistently underperformed and failed to deliver for the last 30 years. Um, so I think that's uh, an interesting challenge you've got in front of you. So if we, if we start right at the big picture, um, unless you live under a rock, you've heard the news that uh, to feed nine to 10 billion people by uh, 2050, we're gonna have to increase uh, total food production globally by probably 70%, depending on which number you use. So that's certainly in terms of global demand, in terms of the total outlook for agriculture, that's a very positive story and that's certainly been um, pushing the numbers. And it's interesting in that, that even though we do tend to talk a little bit about the protein story, uh, dairy, red meats, etc., cetera, um, there's almost as much growth projected, so the red lines are the uh, 2050 demand and the, the blue lines are the 2007 numbers. So there's almost as much growth projected for the horticulture sector as there is um, in terms of uh, red meat and the protein story. So even though it sometimes gets overlooked in this whole discussion, um, there's certainly the numbers there and the projections there suggest that horticulture has got as much to gain out of the growing population and the growing wealth of consumers as the other sectors of agriculture. And certainly if you look at um, China, for example, and look at the per capita consumption, so kilograms per capita per year, um, of fruit and vegetables starting at this end in 1960 and uh, uh, up to 2007. Um, you see um, uh, fruit perhaps not so much, but vegetables in particular, um, uh, incredible growth in um, consumption of those products as um, the, the wealth effects started to flow through as urbanisation started to occur in China. So um, certainly the numbers uh, on those projections suggest, or on those actual statistics rather than projections, suggest that the projections are, are correct in, in, in assessing that there's a lot of potential there. And if you look at some other projections, these are some numbers that were re released recently in some research that was done, and it basically is looking at, oh, sorry, clumsy fingers this morning, um, basically looking at the 
um, projected availability of fruit and vegetables to 2025 and 2050 um, compared to the projected demand. So they've, they've based the projected demand on population growth, etc. Um, and so where the supply need ratio is equal to one, um, that suggests they're confident that um, the, the production will be able to keep up with demand. So uh, obviously in the high income countries, they, they're suggesting the demand will be able to be met by supply and in um, some of the upper middle income countries, perhaps out to 2050, but certainly overall suggesting there's a deficit there. So in other words, that demand will exceed supply or is projected to exceed supply based on uh, the numbers that are available at the moment. So certainly all that is positive for horticulture. And if you look at um, the, the general picture of food prices, including um, some of the horticultural products, we certainly know that the story was uh, up until about 2000, um, uh, generally negative, even in nominal terms, let alone real terms. And since that time, positive, albeit there's been a, um, a cooling off in the last uh, uh, 18, uh, uh, six to 12 months. But generally, that tells us that something's happened there um, and, and that sort of demand slash wealth effect is starting to affect um, uh, prices in, in the marketplace in the global sense. And certainly if we look at our dairy industry, our beef industry, our lamb industry, and, and just look at the numbers uh, going to China, um, there's certainly a real story there of that sort of growth that's been projected. But, and there's always a but, let's have a look at the reality. Um, I think the first reality we need to recognise is despite um, that demand, um, and despite the fact that a lot of our leaders and a lot of our commentators say and not only that, but this demand is in our region, um, I, think that's, I think proximity is, is in fact uh, a mis, uh, 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 an absolutely misleading concept. Um, and, and we did some research a, a, a while ago looking at the differences in freight on a 40-foot container of refrigerated product from all the different exporting nations. And even countries like uh, Brazil, where you have to go all the way around South America, up through the Panama Canal and across to Shanghai. Um, the difference in terms of cents per kilo on the freight was only about 12 cents. And freight rates have actually come down since then um, as the economic activity in the world has slowed down a bit. So this whole notion that proximity, that this, this growth is in our region and it's therefore ours for the taking, I think needs to be, uh, to be cast aside very quickly because certainly the the numbers um, suggest that's not the case. And even if we move to the high value stuff in air freight, um, the differences are nowhere near the sort of numbers that you would anticipate uh, to give us a real advantage. So I think that's the first thing we need to cast aside straight away. The second thing I think um, probably doesn't get enough attention, and that is that, that if we look at the global numbers, that uh, projection of 70% increase by 2050, if you do your maths, um, that is met with a productivity growth rate on average over that period of about 1.5% per annum. So, so if you start with an index of 100 here as the 2015 global agricultural output and you want to get to 170% by 2050, um, the, the, the number that, that basically meets that requirement is, is about 1.5% productivity growth a year. Um, or, or production growth a year, not necessarily productivity growth a year. And if you look at the performance of global agriculture over the last 40 or 50 years, in fact, the average productivity growth is around about 2.3% per annum. So in fact, um, globally, agriculture has been able to more than match that requirement over the last 40 to 50 years. Now, now I know some of you will say, yeah, but we haven't got any warm water, the, the availability of land is going to be more limited, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But even when you look at these numbers, um, for example, the expansion of irrigated land contribution to that growth hasn't been all that major and, in fact, in some periods has been actually quite small. So most of the gain has actually been improvements in total factor productivity, producing more from the same or less inputs. So. Um, the, the whole notion that the world's going to run out of food and uh, we're not going to be able to feed the, the 9 to 10 billion, 
particularly when they're wealthier and urbanised. I think we need to be a bit careful about that. The, unless climate change really has an impact on um, the potential for productivity growth, unless um, technology doesn't keep performing the way it has performed over the last 40 to 50 years, um, some would say the 1.5 per cent per annum average is a snack. It won't be a problem at all. Um, so that, I think, should sober us up in terms of um, what future demand and, and uh, um, demand conditions might look like. And, and particularly if we look at Australia's performance in terms of productivity over the last uh, period since about 1997, um, where depends on whose estimate you use, but uh, agriculture in total has only been able to achieve about a 0.3% per annum growth rate here in total factor productivity in Australia compared to, so that's Australia there, compared to uh, Canada, the USA, uh, Brazil and New Zealand. Now, New Zealand got a free kick because they knocked down a lot of their forests and put up a lot of dairy. And uh, so they actually got extra land, which was already in use. So in terms of total factor productivity, they got uh, a kick in terms of the numbers there. And you can certainly see that there. But even so, um, uh, and we, uh, I guess we'd say, well, hang on, the millennium drought from 2003 to 2009-10 um, was, was a big factor of that because about a third of our agricultural output is grain and it certainly got knocked then. But uh, it certainly does bring you back to earth that um, the, the demand is perhaps um, overstated and we need to be careful about that. And our capacity to supply is perhaps under question as well. And so... Um, exactly where this, whether this is going to be a big gain in terms of agriculture in Australia and horticulture more specifically, I guess is an open question. And certainly if you look at our export performance, um, uh, if we look at the big five markets in Asia, so China, India, Indonesia, Japan and Korea, and look at where their agricultural imports have been coming from and what the growth rates have been over the last uh, uh, 10 to 15 years, um, the USA and Brazil have certainly been taking the lion's share of that growth. Australia hasn't done too badly. Uh, New Zealand's done reasonably well in, in percentage terms, but basically the lion's share of that um, extra demand has been met by um, uh, China, uh, by Brazil and um, the USA. And of course, a lot of that extra demand has been for things like feed grains, which uh, we're not all that uh, strong in terms of exporting, whereas uh, soybeans out of the US, out of Brazil and uh, corn out of the US has certainly met that demand. Um, and in fact, if we look at Australia's performance right across the board in each of the major regions we export to, where the red bars are the average annual growth in import demand in those regions, and the green bars are Australia's uh, growth in export value to those regions, there's really only North Asia where Australia's been able to hold its own. And a lot of that's the, um, the, the beef story, particularly to Japan and Korea, because, of course, the US and Canada were knocked out of both those markets as a result of the mad, scare, mad, scare, mad cow scare in uh, 2004. So we've, we've pretty much had those markets on our own, and they're our major exporters there. But most of the other markets, um, Australia has lost significant market share in terms of our export markets in each of those countries. In other words, the growth has been occurring in demand, but we haven't been able to meet supply. And certainly if we look at our horticulture sector, um, uh, whilst there has been growth, and certainly growth, uh, so fruit and nuts are the blue bars, uh, uh, red on top is vegetables. Um, whilst we have had some growth, um, a lot of that has been things like almonds in the last couple of years in terms of fruit and nuts. And we certainly haven't had much growth overall in, for example, the vegetable sector. And even in wine grape production, we've probably plateaued since about 2001 too in terms of total production, or in fact uh, decreased in total. So um, whilst uh, those markets have been expanding, um, we certainly haven't kicked goals in terms of uh, total agricultural output here, and particularly in terms of horticultural output. And if we go further and look at uh, our export performance, Again, we've done all right in the last 12 months or so, but you would argue that um, since about the turn of the century, um, things have been pretty static in terms of horticultural exports out of Australia. So our export performance in, in, in this area hasn't been that good. And in fact, if we look at the net figure, uh, offset that against our imports, and these are imports of fresh um, product, not, uh, not processed product, uh, 
Um, in fact, uh, uh, imports have grown uh, substantially faster than our exports have, and, and we're probably uh, almost at the point of being uh, net importers in some respects of, of fresh product. And, and that's further reinforced if we go around and look at uh, market share of any of the major exporters out of the horticulture sector, any of the major exports out of the horticulture sector. Um, take, for example, wine. Uh, wine, we did very well. We were growing market share in global terms. Um, and then we got to about 2003, 4, and, and, and back we went. Um, even though the total export markets were growing, um, I think the, the summary of that is um, wine decided on uh, a bulk, uh, low-cost uh, uh, export strategy just at the same time as most of the New World exporters really got going with exactly the same product, but uh, at a fair bit cheaper than we were able to do it. So um, that's been certainly a, a pretty sad story when it comes to uh, export performance for the wine sector. If we look at uh, a whole range of other products, uh, oranges, for example, while generally the picture has been of growth in terms of exports for most of exporting nations, again, in terms of market share, um, Australia's uh, share of that global market has, uh, in fact, uh, decreased over that period. Uh, if we look at uh, carrots and turnips, for example, same sort of picture emerges. If we look at uh, apples, for example, the same sort of picture emerges. Um, obviously, a much bigger volume traded globally, and therefore our share of that's uh, much less. But certainly, uh, in terms of um, other nations able, able to grow their uh, export products, um, uh, and Australia not able to grow in terms of our export performance. So, and if we, we, we try and sum all that up with uh, trends in fruit and vegetable trade, um, of course, the, 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 the figure starts to look reasonably negative. I think uh, last year, of the 11 billion food imports into Australia, uh, a substantial proportion of that was, in fact, um, processed and, uh, and some of it fresh fruit and vegetables and horticulture products. So um, certainly not a pretty picture. So that, that minister that I was talking about uh, at the start of the story um, uh, might be starting to have second thoughts by the time uh, you have a look at the actual performance as opposed to, as, as opposed to the potential. Um, and if we look at, uh, say, for example, in global terms, the value of fruit and vegetable exports um, uh, and compare Australia, Australia's that, that green line there, it's probably a bit hard to see. New Zealand, uh, we're probably about equivalent. We've just gone ahead of New Zealand slightly uh, in terms of Israel, a country um, probably about the size of northeastern Victoria, uh, nearly matching us. Um, Canada been able to grow there substantially, and yes, I know that there's a fair bit of Caribbean labour in Canada that, uh, that performs pretty cheaply, and, uh, and that gives them an advantage. And they're next to the US, which is a major market, so yes, they have advantages. But even uh, a country like the Netherlands, uh, very land constrained, has been able to form along that basis. Now, now, there is um, another part to the Netherlands story, of course, because if you look at um, the import value, um, it's grown as much as well. So the Netherlands has become a, um, a, a, a packing, logistics, freight, repacking um, um, headquarters in terms of a lot of the product that comes into Europe. But even so, it's still been able to grow the value add, um, uh, particularly in terms of things like glasshouse production. And uh, it certainly shows... Um, and, and again, it's got proximity to Europe, proximity to those seven or 800 pretty wealthy consumers, all pretty keen on fruit. But certainly it does show that uh, Australia's performance, with the advantages we've got in terms of land, in terms of space, um, in terms of a whole range of other things, hasn't been all that flash when it comes to horticulture. So what are some of the challenges that seem to be getting in the road? Um, I think the first one, and the one that always strikes me most strongly, is this whole issue of scale. Um, when we look at the various agriculture sectors and segment the farm sizes, uh, segment the population in relation to farm sizes, the thing that always stands out is that both horticulture and broadacre livestock have this enormous preponderance of um, very small scale operations, so less than 100,000 worth of total output in horticulture, 50% of total producers fall into that category. Uh, in livestock, it's more than that. It's uh, up to 70%, and a lot of that's the beef industry, and a lot of that's uh, hectares around major regional centres, etc. But certainly, in terms of horticulture, there's an enormous number of um, very small-scale operators, and uh, that's certainly always been a challenge when it comes to uh, 
um, things like exports, things like uh, consistent supply, all those sorts of things. Um, and even you look at it and, and you would think, well, OK, if, if that small-scale uh, farm business structure is a problem, surely over time um, the forces that come to bear would, would force the growth of that and you would see consolidation and scale. But in fact, you, you almost see the opposite. So this is the breakup of um, the demographics of vegetable growing farms in Australia, uh, less than five, five to 20, 20 to 70 and more than 70 hectares. And what you're actually seeing is a reduction in the number of larger scale farm businesses rather than a consolidation into the numbers. Now, now some of that might be to do with irrigation and concentration, more intensive production, but certainly the overall picture is one where, where you would expect to see consolidation into larger units and more efficient production units. You're not, in fact, seeing that. So that's certainly a real challenge, um, particularly in horticulture. I guess in some ways related to that is, is the, um, uh, not just the farm structure, but I suspect the industry structure, if you want to describe it as that, is one that's always been um, chronically disjointed. So if you look at the horticulture sector, I think there's 43 separate bodies um, at the national level um, represent the various components of horticulture. And that doesn't count for state and regional level organisations of which there's probably at least that many again, if not more. So um, the industry, in a sense, in setting its direction, in setting its policy and in presenting itself to government has always been chronically um, uh, disaggregated into, into quite small units. And in fact, um, a significant number of those organisations um, probably wouldn't survive were they to depend entirely on membership numbers and membership revenue. Um, in fact, a lot of their uh, operational revenue in, 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 in a lot of instances are, are uh, basically levy funds um, from, from organisations like Horticulture Innovation Australia Limited. So this, um, uh, the chronic uh, size problem, if you like, at the farm level is, is almost, again, um, reflected in the, the issues at the industry level where to try and get a, a, a clear line, a clear direction, a clear response from industry um, has typically involved uh, uh, a very um, convoluted and very disjointed approach from that industry. So that, I think, flows through in a whole range of different areas into the, some of the problems the industry challenge, industry faces. Um, I think the other, the other problem, uh, and I guess related to that, is, is the way um, the R&D uh, arrangements are in Australia. We, we certainly cover a lot of geography, and that sometimes works to our disadvantage, but I think increasingly we're seeing um, the major universities in particular um, becoming uh, almost isolated from industry. Um, and I, I use the example of the Knowledge Centre for Agriculture in Denmark, which has um, 400 extension staff, um, the University of Aachen, and uh, uh, about that number of researchers again, and then a whole pile of industry organisations, um, all located on the same campus or within close proximity to each other. And sure, they've got the advantage of geography there. Um, Denmark's only two-thirds the size of Tasmania. But we see the same sort of structure, structure in, in uh, the Netherlands with uh, Wangenin. Um, again, industry, university researchers, um, uh, in diverse, uh, university, uh, industry processes and exporters all uh, operating in a cluster and all interacting with each other. And that seems to be certainly one of the secrets to growth. I think what we're uh, trying to deal with here in Australia is, is certainly amongst the group of eight universities, uh, universities that are driven by um, overseas student numbers, which in turn requires them to publish their, their research internationally to get up the rankings to attract more students. And the last thing that you want if you're doing that is to have to go out and interact with industry. So I think we've, we've developed a, an R&D model here or a, a research uh, model here that industry is actually a problem to rather than a partner in. And I think that's, um, that's not unique to horticulture. In fact, a centre like this is probably um, uh, unique in some respects in having industry with close researchers interaction and, and government interaction, but uh, I think it's a bigger problem, that whole structure of how the R&D is done in Australia, 
and how the universities work in Australia is, is a real problem that, that affects the industry. On top of that, we've had uh, declining state government revenues, and I know um, um, each of the various state departments I talk to talk hopefully about um, their future and the investment and the, um, the role that governments will play in, in continuing to support agriculture, but um, the, the performance over the long term um, tends to be one where we tend to keep seeing cuts to the Department of Agriculture. And I know Victoria had it a couple of years ago and, and Western Australia is copying it this year, but um, it always seems to go one way. So I think um, that's a particular challenge for the industry as well, given um, the structure of the universities and then given the structure of the state departments where resources are certainly becoming more limited. Of course, the other issue um, that's always been a challenge uh, over recent times in Australia is, uh, is the, um, the, uh, the thousand pound gorilla sitting in the corner and it's particularly a challenge for perishable products like horticulture where um, you're going to have a volume of product coming onto the market quite quickly. It doesn't uh, last very long. You need an outlet. There's the outlet, but of course the outlet uh, uh, doesn't necessarily do you any favours when it comes to pricing or uh, profitability. And so we look at uh, our major food processes, for example, Burgeye, Edgels, uh, McCain's, uh, SPC, uh, and all of them have had chronic problems in generating a profit and, and, and being able to grow over the last decade or two. And I, I think um, the thousand pound gorilla in the corner uh, has a fair bit to do with that. And of course, if they are the platform to export success, which of course they are in overseas locations and they're absolutely scratched for profit here in Australia, then the potential for them to develop a platform and develop that export potential is, uh, is certainly severely limited. So that, um, I guess there's some of the challenges. Do we actually have any opportunities? Well, I think, I think we do because um, we, tend to, we tend to forget this, but I, I, I keep coming back to it. And I know it's overly simplistic, but certainly as um, consumers, not only in Australia, but around the world get wealthier, um, their, 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 their needs and their requirements uh, move up good old Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, that, uh, in fact, in some respects, even though we might think things like uh, uh, animal welfare standards, uh, pesticide uh, regulations, all those sorts of things are impediments to production, in some respects, um, they sit Australian industries well um, to, to be performing at that um, higher level in terms of consumer demands and wants and needs where the consumers are prepared to pay more um, for those particular products. So um, in, in very broad picture terms, um, our capacity and our ability um, to meet those sorts of higher order requirements is in fact better than uh, an, a, a lot of the competitors in the marketplace. And, and you know, we only have to go to the, um, to the Nana's Berries example as, as a classic case, even though um, the, the, the origin of the, um, the food safety problem hasn't really been sorted. Um, the reality is that consumers are wary of um, imported products. Uh, I heard the managing director of Paddy's Food say yesterday that about $50 million had been knocked off um, the annual revenue uh, generated by frozen berries as a consequence of that scare. And uh, we've heard all the announcements about retailers and others seeking domestic suppliers for those products. So there's a classic uh, uh, case study, if you like, of um, wealthier consumers um, having those sorts of concerns and being prepared to pay for it, and that having some consequence in terms of the performance of Australian product in the marketplace. Um, I think the second, and related to that, I think um, whilst we continually struggle uh, in terms of deciding whether there's enough resources allocated to biosecurity, by and large, Australia has a pretty good story to tell. And, and it was interesting to hear James mention, uh, not James, Luke mention that uh, biosecurity, and particularly in relation to how it affects market access, is, is going to be an increased focus. And I think um, there's quite an important issue there because um, that uh, market access uh, very much depends on the biosecurity status. Um, for all our concerns about um, our performance, we actually do biosecurity reasonably well in Australia, and uh, that's uh, quite an important part of the platform uh, around uh, what is the product that comes out of Australia, what are its inherent characteristics, and 
where should it be positioned in the market. So I think that is uh, quite, a, a, quite a, a, a good opportunity. And I think related to that is the sort of example we see out of a horticulture sector like that of the Netherlands. So if you look at the Netherlands, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a hectare, uh, a couple of million dollars to put up a glass house, uh, very limited space. Everything works against it, um, and yet it's uh, it's been able to develop an enormously successful horticulture sector out of a combination of things. I think um, they promote themselves very well. So Dutch horticulture has uh, quite a strong profile. Um, they are very strong on science, and some of the major operators in there um, uh, are, are spending up to 10% of their annual turnover on R&D. So they're very driven by the advantages that technology can bring. And, and of course, they're, they're, um, they've got proximity and, 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 and a whole chain um, uh, profile that, that works to their advantage. But nevertheless, um, I think this combination of being very good at promoting um, the characteristics and the values inherent in in, uh, in Dutch horticulture, uh, combined with the reliance on technology and uh, and uh, and uh, working right through the whole chain and having that sort of integration between the research and the industry is is working very well. Um, if if you were sort of say there's a there's a glaring weakness in uh, in horticulture in Australia, it's it's around here because uh, what tends to happen is we have something like uh, the Paddy's Berries case where. Uh, everyone suddenly decides uh, Chinese berries are bad and we don't want those. Um, and, and the automatic assumption is that everyone will change to Australian product, but no one is telling uh, consumers why Australian product uh, is any better. Uh, we haven't got that strategy around um, uh, promoting the inherent values of the Australian product. Um, sure, we have uh, occasionally we'll see uh, promotion for apples or for bananas or for um, summer fruits or a whole range of different products, but um, in all those, there's a common theme around things like biosecurity, of, around things like environmental sustainability, around things like um, uh, pesticides and all those sorts of things that we do pretty well here, but we, we actually don't have a strategy in place to actually talk about that to Australian consumers, let alone international consumers. So. Um, lessons that are available from places like New Zealand, from places like Holland, even from places like Canada, where those inherent national characteristics are put together as a story and promoted to consumers as part of the reason. I mean, we, I think our strategy at this stage is put a green kangaroo on it and that'll automatically mean everyone eats it, but uh, I'm not sure that's sustainable in the longer term. Um, and, and I guess the other issue is, um, and again, we look to New Zealand and the example of a Zespri, for example, there, which is essentially a cooperative uh, developed uh, out of um, a, a whole range of problems in the kiwi fruit industry over there, um, has grown enormously, um, has developed a, a whole of chain approach involving uh, R&D and promotion and export marketing and, and doing enormously well. And uh, that's sort of uh, some of the advantages that can be gained out of industries working together collaboratively, uh, collaboratively and working in uh, structures like cooperatives, which um, we can look at Batlow, we can perhaps look at one or two others, but we tended, we've tended not to do those very well in Australia. So um, uh, perhaps bananas have done it better than others, but uh, it's, it's pretty hard to see examples where um, that sort of structure has developed, uh, really promoted the product, really grown export markets and, uh, and, and taken a whole of industry approach to, um, to, uh, to promoting the product. So there's some good examples there. And um, whilst labour and labour costs are certainly a challenge in Australia when you talk of $23, $24 an hour uh, for labour here compared to probably $7.50 in, in the, um, the orchards of California, probably to $2 or $1 in uh, Brazil or perhaps in China itself. Um, on the other hand, that's led to um, a, a lot more technological approach to uh, what we do here, and I think that perhaps stands to some advantage in the longer term. So getting robotics, getting uh, data uh, and getting those sort of things up and running and working to lift productivity um, are going to stand us in good stead in the long run. So even though that labour cost is a disadvantage, um, the fact that we're moving to alternatives to labour is probably going to stand us well in the long term. Um, the other interesting development, and again it comes out of the Paddy's Food thing, is 
this whole notion of local foods and 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 being a bit more interested in where, where food comes from and so there's a lot of stories particularly for the domestic market around that that uh, could be used to great advantage um, particularly um, uh, in relation to relationships with supermarkets because I think the supermarkets have probably been through an era where uh, they were riding roughshod over um, the suppliers and uh, and had uh, a fair bit of control and I think there's now almost a consumer backlash and in fact I saw some figures the other day where there's a certain uh, there's certainly a trend back to independent green grocers and independent sources of um, uh, fresh produce rather than buying through the supermarkets so that trend linked to local promotions and local branding is certainly um, something that can be used to advantage in the sector and, and avoid the, um, the squeeze of the thousand pound gorilla, hopefully. Um, so what are some conclusions? Uh, the horticulture sector is fragmented, lacking strategic direction and export focus. It has the most potential, I think, in a lot of respects of um, agriculture sectors in Australia, but uh, it doesn't seem to be able to get it all together in a way that makes sense. Um, the larger operators are emerging, but farm scale still remains a major limitation. And of course, with that um, fragmented and uh, small scale farm operation, the issues of productivity are also a challenge. Um, the supply chains are continuing to develop, but they're predominantly probably more for the larger enterprises, and a lot of them have a domestic focus. So we certainly see um, uh, groups like Rugby Farms supplying uh, lettuce to the major retailers but again uh, they don't really have an export focus and, and there's a small number of them tending to develop those supply chains. Um, and the other I suppose sitting at the back of all this and relevant to this group here is that we have um, started down the road to what you might call a more privatised innovation system um, and we've certainly seen that more in the grains industry or in the cotton industry in Australia where um, the scale of operations is such that they can afford, um, industry can afford to largely uh, fund and operate its own research and development but also its own extension services. Um, uh, that certainly happened to some degree in the grains industry, the transition from um, the district agronomist, if you like, to the, um, to the paid agronomist uh, has happened over the last uh, 20 years or so. I think there's now roughly 50 FTEs of district agronomists left in Australia in the public service and about 2,500 uh, operating in the private sector. That certainly happened in horticulture, but I think um, one of the challenges will be um, the industry structure and the fact that there's that still large population of small-scale farms and therefore the, um, the innovation system and the way to get those um, innovations through to that scale of operation um, is going to be a bit more of a challenge because, of course, they're less likely to be um, to be paying for um, those sorts of services. So um, that, I think, remains a challenge for horticulture as well. So uh, it's probably not all good news. I certainly think the potential's there, but uh, there's some obviously some real challenges, and I guess uh, the department is very well placed, in Victoria in particular, uh, to address some of those challenges, but uh, uh, it won't be easy. Uh, However, hopefully that's some food for thought. So what do you think? Questions? Uh, Nigel Crump from uh, Vixbar. At the start of your presentation, you compared a minister that was new and seeing the opportunities and an old minister seeing the failure. What advice do you think that the old minister could give to the new minister? <laughs> could someone um, write this down, please? <laughs> It's a real challenge because, because you've sort of got a, a top and bottom problem. I think, I think to, to really, I know we tend to overlook it sometimes, but I think to get industry consolidated in terms of its representation and its structure is quite important because getting a cohesive story out of industry and getting agreement on direction is, is, is quite important. Um, but at the same time, you've got that consolidation or, or the, the problem at the, at the small end of the scale with, with so many small scale growers. And I mean, I guess uh, uh, things have got to take their course there. But uh, um, if, I think if you could get the industry structure sorted out a bit better, at least you could get some agreed direction. I think that might actually do more than you think it would do. And I know from a minister's perspective, that probably gives them the freedom to move in terms of not getting uh, shrapnel 
every time they, they uh, make a, a move in a particular direction, um, getting the industry actually in a, in, a, in a way that, you know, speaks with a common voice and, and gives a bit of consolidated thought to where they're going is quite important. Now, how you do that, I don't know. Um, uh, some have likened it to putting a, a 20 fighting cats into a super bag and hoping <laughs> something com common comes out of it. It's a real problem. But from the industry's perspective, or from the minister's perspective, getting that right um, helps a lot in terms of research direction, in terms of uh, infrastructure and industry development, all those sorts of things. But uh, yeah, it's an easy, easy answer for a hard question. Thanks. I'm Liz Cameron from the GV Food Co-op. Uh, one of the things, Mick, that I reckon we've been trying to do is, is very much related to what you're saying, except that we're treating the small farms as though that's a uh, competitive advantage rather than, rather than negative. Um, I think there's 40 um, different farmers and most of those adding value to their, own, to their own product. My feeling is that many of those people are coming up with products that blow your mind. They're not seen anywhere else in the major industrial production of our, of our horticulture. I just wonder whether or not... Um, where we're struggling is obviously how do you market. We are also trying to get around the gorilla by sort of direct relationship between obviously those 40 producers and, uh, and the customer. Um, marketing that when you've got no budget for that marketing really relies on the age or, or GTV um, taking over some of your publicity for you. But I just wonder whether you feel as though that sort of direction around small farms may have some uh, legs if we work it. Because it will fit with Maslow's hierarchy too, I think. Won't it? Yeah, no, and, and look, there's no doubt about that. And, and certainly you see that in the beef industry, you see it in, in the lamb industry, for example, where, where people package and brand a product and go direct to consumers to get around some of those problems. Um, I, I think the chronic problem with, with those is always, as you say, how do you get the capital together to actually kick some goals and make some progress around that? And that's always a challenge. I mean, the organic milk producer is an interesting one where they've got quite strict controls over who can come in and they've negotiated uh, quite strong contractual agreements with their members in terms of supply. Now, whether you can go that far in, 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 in a horticulture structure uh, is an interesting question. I think the other problem in Australia has always been that um, agriculture is much more volatile in terms of returns here than it is in most parts of the world. So a lot of farmers aren't prepared to forego some of their capital, some of their profit, to put it towards a cooperative structure and allow it to grow, whereas what you tend to see internationally is um, quite strong views about um, uh, allowing some of the farm capital to, to contribute towards the greater good and, and therefore the cooperatives become very strong. So uh, I, I'd be, I'd be uh, uh, Moses coming down from the mountain with a tablet if I could give you the, the, the good answer, but I, I think the, there are some models. And, and the other bit I've, I've observed is what you tend to see in some of the European situations in particular, but also in the land grants in the US, is what they almost call incubators. So they will have facilities within close proximity of their R&D uh, centres, and they might have concessional rent on, on the property for two or three years. They might have um, free or um, uh, 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 a quantum of access to expertise be it marketing, be it um, R&D or whatever, be it technical support. So they, they tend to get those small startups in close to these, um, these clusters, if you like, of industry expertise and help them to grow that way and, and try, and, try and foster them that way rather than leaving them to fend for themselves. And so maybe there's an example there, and getting back to the previous question, maybe there's an example there of trying to get clusters a bit like this but perhaps involving industry more uh, might be a way to uh, to get that sort of stuff happening a bit better. Mm. Thanks, Liz. Was it a question at this table here? Was it Michelle or <coughs> Michelle? Is that one? Yeah. Mick, an excellent presentation. Thank you, um, Michelle Christo from AHEA. Um, you mentioned that we should cast aside our proximity. Um, I tend to disagree on that. In that, if we can get market access into most of our Asian nations. We can get produce there quickly, a lot faster than our competitors. We might not get it there cheaper, but uh, there's a definite market need where we can get high prices and fill market yep. gaps. Yeah, certainly, certainly time to market, particularly in, a, in an industry like horticulture, is, is quite important. Um, I guess I was just making the point that, you know, everyone sort of at the policy level sorts, seems to say, oh, it's, it's Asia, it's our region. 
uh, and I was just trying to make them. It's not our bloody region at all. In fact, um, I think uh, the Netherlands has probably done a lot better at exporting horticultural products to Asia than we have. Um, Canada has certainly done a lot better than we have. Um, so that proximity thing is a false, uh, a false concept in many respects. But you're right, with perishable product, uh, with air freighted product, uh, the high value stuff, um, yeah, there's a big advantage there in being able to have it off the farm and 24 hours later it's on the street in Shanghai. That's, uh, that's certainly an advantage. So just if we've got market access. Indeed. Market access, the theme for the morning. Thanks. Final question. Anna Preka from Food Innovation Australia, the new Food and Agribusiness Growth Centre at the federal level. The virtual, <laughs> the virtual. Um, oh, thank you. It was great insights and great overview of some of the challenges. The question is, um, you provided two examples about New Zealand and Holland in terms of how they've done a great job. So I suppose the question is, what's the role of government and part of the reason I suppose you didn't touch on why Holland and New Zealand have done so well in some sectors is because of the role of government in one, um, providing the strategic leadership and the vision so the industries then organise themselves to actually realise that yep. vision. So I suppose, are you able to touch on that? Yeah, uh, and, and that, that's a challenge because um, you've got groups like um, Horticulture Innovation Australia or Horticulture Australia um, has struggled for a long while um, to, to, to get that strategic direction and, and in fact, uh, you know, the 43 uh, different groups have tend to actually go the other way, have tended to want to jam jar um, their, um, their, their levies and, and, and operate within their own little silos rather than um, perhaps take a bit more collective approach to some of the big picture issues. But that's, uh, what, but that's what I mean, that it's the role of government to put the mechanisms in place to allow the industry to actually yep. realise that. So and I think, you know, I think around innovation and R&D, um, there is a role for the federal government. I mean, Minister McFarlane came out last week with a series of statements about getting R&D closer to commercial industry. I, I read through those and I can't for the life of me tell how that's going to make a difference because when you talk to the researchers, they say, it's publish or perish here. If we don't publish international publications, uh, we don't get our ranking up and therefore we don't attract overseas students and we don't get ERA points from the Australian Research Council, so the whole thing grinds to a halt. So now you're telling me you want me to go and spend time mucking around with industry on, on a project that um, might suit my expertise, but I'm not going to get any publishable outcomes out of it. Um, I'm not going to do it. And, and so I, I had this discussion with uh, a senior researcher from the University of New South Wales, and I said, you know, this structure doesn't work for industry. And he said, it works for me. That was his response. And I think that, to me, that summed up the whole problem. Yeah. Uh, and I wish Minister McFarlane had gone a lot further, but he, unfortunately, uh, the, the whole issue of impact in terms of ERA points, for example, hasn't, still hasn't been addressed. So um, getting, uh, knocking heads between the, the innovation sector, if you like, and the industry itself, uh, when you look at the examples where it's worked in, in places like Europe, in places like New Zealand, that's what's happened. Uh, that cluster sort of approach has uh, actually made a difference.